Young Turks. I am your host, Jane Huger. We are sponsored by Netflix, by the way. Netflix.com slash TYT is your free trial membership. I should say that in the beginning of every show, but I don't. Okay, uh, so listen, we got a big show ahead for you guys. Uh, in the second hour, it is true that we have breasts and lesbians, but we also have a lot more than that. Uh, because that lesbian controversy is a very interesting one that has political ramifications and uh, <laughs> do bigger breasts lead to be better tips among other crazy fascinating stories that's in the second hour and then we have a great movie review for you actually about oil uh, and our uh, what that's leading to etc in the third hour uh, in this hour two very important stories if you ask me uh, number one uh, the Newsweek story I think has enormous ramifications uh, Newsweek is dead and I am full of remorse now it's time to dance, as Sprockets would say. All right, that's a little bit later in this hour. And also, uh, the most important story is uh, the Senate had a vote yesterday. And how that vote came out is, I think, enormously important. So we'll, that, again, is coming up in a little bit. But first, I want to start with a whole bunch of updates for you guys. Uh, um, number one, uh, the jobs numbers came in. This is a big story today. Every month, we're looking at the jobs numbers to see if the economy is improving. And we had good news, bad news uh, for this past month. The bad news is unemployment rose to 9.9%. But the good news is we actually added 290,000 jobs. Now, how does that make sense? It's because um, more people are encouraged about uh, the job market and are re-entering the job market. So even though we've created new jobs, more people entered the job market. And hence, the unemployment number went up as a percentage. But overall, the main thing to look at, if you're asking me, is if, did we add jobs? And we did. We added 290,000 jobs. I think that's pretty damn good. Some of those were census jobs, but a great majority of them were private sector jobs. So I'm hopeful about that. That's very good news. Uh, all right, that's point number one. Point number two, we had another scare in Times Square. Uh, and it just chalked us up to being more vigilant. Uh, they had to close off a certain section of it. There was an eerie silence in Times Square, and it, there was a cooler that uh, seemed suspicious. They opened it up and found water and sandwiches. It's fine. Okay. Now, it turns out New York City has about 100 false alarms a day, uh, which is amazing if you think about it. But since the Times Square bombing, it's gone up about 33%. Uh, in fact, on Thursday, there was 145, which is, of course, a little higher, 145 false alarms. But look, they're being vigilant. Everybody's on the lookout. That's a good thing. And nothing wrong with that. They were a little extra careful, but it was nothing. Uh, by the way, the one other thing they mentioned in the article that was fun, they said people are finding uh, stuff that they lost uh, a lot better than they were before. Because people are reporting everything. They're like, oh, my God, it's a purse. It's a purse. It's going to blow. And then they find, oh, it's a purse. It's John... Well, that would be curious. It's Mary Stevens' person, then they return it to her, and she's like, oh, thank God. They found somebody else's lunch uh, just yesterday. <laughs> so, so good news out of bad. I uh, just wonder how you lose lunch so easily. That's a good question. And how do you, how do, no, my question is, how do you know whose lunch it was? I guess the guy comes back and goes, oh, where's my lunch? Oh, thanks, we just shut down 6th Avenue because of your frickin' lunch. Uh, I don't, do people put their names on it? Uh, so, all right. Now, uh, another update for you that's also fun. Uh, remember, Florida was debating the anti bestiality law because they're one of 12 states that actually does not outlaw bestiality. And so, if you want to uh, have unnatural relations with an animal in Florida, it is perfectly legal. Well, I mean, I'm sure the animal wouldn't appreciate it, but. And right now, there's a man in jail in South Carolina by the name of Rodell who's thinking, mm, 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 when I get out, I'm heading straight down to the panhandle. <laughs> okay. So, but they were, they brought it back up and they were debating it. Now, it had failed a couple of times before, and we told you about that. But, I mean, come on, this time it's up uh, and they're going to get a vote on it. So, of course, it's going to pass. You know what happened today? It failed. I don't, wait, 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 wait. How's that possible? <laughs> Who voted in favor of bestiality? <laughs> well, it turns out that there was a hundred different machinations. They p wanted to put it in the Senate bill and the House bill, and then, but they didn't want to debate it. Uh, and I'm going to tell you why in a second. So they put it in an agriculture bill, but that portion of the agriculture bill didn't work. And so the next thing you know, it, it didn't pass. Okay, it didn't get through. Now, why did they put it in the agriculture bill and go through all this nonsense? They were embarrassed to debate it. 
like including the conservatives, of course, who are against it. Everybody's against it, right? But they're like, well, we got two issues. One, people are going to think that we're wasting time when we should be concentrating on unemployment. And then number two, if we have a debate on it, it's going to be uncomfortable. I mean, that's in the story. That's in the Associated Press story. No, you know, it's not uncomfortable. There's no de who's debating it. Who's pro goat fucking? <laughs> so no, you bring it up. Everybody, hey, should be be having sex with owls and horses and whales. Everybody in favor say aye. Everybody again say nay. That's it. We're done. Okay, boom. <laughs> and as it stands, it didn't happen that way. They were basically the essence of it. Too embarrassed to talk about it. So bestiality still allowed in Florida. So I guess have at it, horse. <laughs> All right, R Rodell is excited, man. He can't wait to get out on parole. He's like, mm-mm, buckle up. <laughs> Regulators, mount up? <laughs> okay, perhaps not. All right, another update for you guys. A uh, lot of discussion, of course, about who's going to replace John Paul Stevens on the Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, the leading candidate appeared to be uh, Alana Kagan. And um, it turns out, well, we, which of course is not anywhere near sure yet, and it's not an announcement, but Mike Allen at Politico has a scoop. And his scoop is, yes, it will be Alana Kagan. Uh, now, <laughs> the world of Washington is really funny, because he gets it first. They're going to announce it apparently on Monday. But in between, there's going to be a coordinated leak on the weekend. So it's three different layers. Somehow Mike Allen stole it before the coordinated leak. But, I mean, it's, look, that stuff is silly because I, I don't care who broke, broke it like three seconds before the other guy. Like, in Washington, that's like a huge deal. Oh, Mike Allen, oh, he got it. Who cares? Uh, okay. it's, we find out today, we find out on Saturday, okay? But what's relevant, of course, is who it is. It's Alana Kagan. And uh, if you don't remember, uh, you know, my quick summary of her, and we'll find out a lot about her if it, in fact, uh, is her. Uh, but uh, from what I've read so far, she's a moderate. Uh, she is someone that is right up Obama's alley. Uh, she listens to all sides, very respectful. Uh, head of uh, dean of Harvard Law School and conservatives there loved her, not because she was a conservative, but she would hear them out, just like Obama. I mean, she has Obama written all over her. So uh, it's the least surprising pick uh, you could imagine. Another woman on the court, which of course a lot of people are happy about, uh, now, how uh, progressive is she? That's a little unclear. She supported uh, conservatives in the past uh, that actually got filibustered by the Democrats under Bush. And that got blocked in, in, in a couple of different ways. Now, the reason she supported them is not because she thought that they are correct. She would say, look, I, I don't agree with some of their writings and their, and their rulings, but, but they're good, honest uh, people. They're part of the conversation in America. And they're, yes, they're conservative, but they're, they're good jurists, which I respect. I, I don't see anything wrong with that. I know some progressives are worried about that, but I'm not. And I think that's perfectly fine for her to do. So, and then she also has decent backing among the conservatives. Now, if it's her, the Republicans will have a harder time filibustering her. There's already been support by people like Orrin Hatch initially. Now, can they find their way to filibuster her? Sure. Now, remember, though, they did not filibuster Sotomayor. So... I mean, there was a lot of stuff they threw at her, the race stuff, the women's stuff, the affirmative action stuff. But in the end, they didn't filibuster her, which was surprising. I lost a bet on that. Now, but it would, also, it would again be surprising if you go two Supreme Court picks under Obama and the Republicans don't filibuster either one of them, their base is going to be livid. So it'll be interesting to see how this one plays out. The reason the Republicans hesitate on that one issue because that's where they made their stand under Bush, where they were like, the filibuster of judicial nominees is perverse and sick and disgusting and horrific. So it would seem, even for Republicans, over-the-top hypocrisy. But, so, wait for it. <laughs> and, and honestly, the, the real issue for me is, I don't, as usual with these picks, no, that's not fair. In, under Bush, Roberts and Alito, we knew exactly where they stood. They had a lot of rulings. And, and so we, it was clear which way they were going to go. Uh, and Sotomayor had a decent uh, amount of rulings that we could look at. With Kagan, she's, was, she's a solicitor general now, and she does not have a lot of writings or rulings. So I, I, 
I don't know where she stands. You know, it, it appears that she's moderate to progressive, but we're just kind of guessing uh, based on her um, track record in academia and in government. So uh, we'll, we'll see. Maybe more, obviously, I think more information will come out if she, in fact, is the nominee. We'll wait for that on Monday and, and see how that hap goes. Now, uh, I've got 100 follow-ups for you guys today, but they're all very important. That's why I'm leading off with them. Uh, the FCC uh, decision. You know, we had a lot, some back and forth on this uh, in the week. Uh, first, it looked like the Washington Post was saying that the FCC is going to throw net neutrality under the bus and that they are not going to regulate uh, the, you know, the, the basically the Internet providers, Comcast, Verizon, and AT&T. And that would have been a terrible betrayal of what Obama said in the campaign, and it would have been a huge problem for the Internet. Uh, then we got a report that they were, that, no, in fact, they were going to regulate them. And I read something today uh, that leads me to believe it is not 100%, it's not set in stone, but it looks pretty good now that, in fact, the FCC will uh, regulate and that they will enforce net neutrality. And that is terrific news, great news. And look, and that's, it, it goes from Obama possibly betraying a promise that would have been, uh, for me, like my, maybe the, ca the straw that broke the camel's back, all the way to the other side, if you ask me, to if John McCain was president, you definitely would not have net neutrality, and that would be terrible. So this is a very good reason to elect a Democrat. You know, you, you don't get anywhere near what you were promised, but, you know, between a rock and a hard place, I guess I'd take the rock because, I don't know which one's softer, which one's harder, but anyway, uh, but it, there's still reason to vote for Democrats, and, and this is a good reason. So. That's very good news. Slightly bad news, um, Rahm Emanuel is uh, thrilled with how Eric Holder is doing his job now, and he says he has his mojo back. That's bad news because Rahm Emanuel is against every civil liberty you can imagine. <laughs> okay. In every internal debate in the White House, according to all the press reports, Rahm Emanuel has been beating Eric Holder up and saying, ah, oh, you guys, you want to give rights to people, but the Republicans say we shouldn't give rights. Let's just give in. Come on, come on, please, please, Obama, let's give in, right? Now, if Emanuel's excited about Eric Holder, <laughs> that can't be a good sign. Uh, I mean, I, I interpret uh, he has his mojo back to finally uh, I've got him under control and those Guantanamo detainees are in a world of hurt. I'm going to wait another couple of years before I do anything with them. So... That's probably an over-interpretation, uh, or as Bush would say, exaggeration. We'll see how it goes. But the good part of this is that, look, Holder's, by all reasonable accounts, uh, done a great job uh, in apprehending the Times Square bomber. And it's not all him. To blame him for everything is ridiculous. To give him credit for everything is ridiculous. Obviously, New York Police Department, FBI, they all did a great job. Uh, but they did get the guy. He did confess. Uh, I think it's... Uh, if you ask me, I, of course, there was all those stories about, you know, when did they get him, about the plane, la, la, la. I think those are just incredibly minor. I think the bottom line is they did a bang-up job of getting the guy and putting him away and having him confess. Remember, for, you know, one of our listeners, I think it was Mallory Eisen, sent, wrote this in, and it's a great point. They never got the anthrax people. Remember the guy who sent the anthrax to all the senators? They just flat out never found him. I mean, that's so egregious. Imagine a Democratic president, and he just never finds a major terrorist, uh, you know, operation against our senators. I mean, my God, Obama found the guy, and it wasn't Obama, but the administration, right? Overall, all the law enforcement, the government, right? They find the guy within about 48 hours. And they're getting grief for it. Oh, no, were you too late? He got on the plane. Oh, no, he got to say bye to his mom. He got to oh, shave that morning. Oh, no, you were uh, 48 hours. They never found the anthrax guys. Okay. You know, here's another guy they never caught. What was it? Oh, right, Osama bin Laden. So Republicans, you don't get to talk about that. You, you drink a very, very tall glass of shut-up juice because you didn't catch dick. Okay. Let's keep it real. Uh, when Bush goes back and captures bin Laden, he rides in on horseback into Pakistan, corrals him, and brings him back home. Then the Republicans can open their mouths about who we did and did not catch. Otherwise, shut the fuck up and move along. See, I got a little excited on that one. 
All right. So, all right. Now, speaking of people who are uh, taking strong action, look, uh, I was unhappy about Obama's uh, plan to do more offshore drilling, and that was announced like a political genius that he is. Uh, that's what I'm told. Uh, right before we had one of the worst oil spills of all time in an offshore rig. Uh, I would say that I was a little vindicated on that, except that would be a gross uh, under-exaggeration, okay? Understatement. Is there an under-exaggeration? Is that possible? Well, if it is, that's what happened, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so that, that was a nice bushes. <laughs> uh, you guys misunderestimated me, okay? So now and somebody who agreed with me was Jane Hampshire. And we, <laughs> for whatever reason, we take... Uh, similar positions uh, a decent amount of times and we t catch similar heat from Obama lovers. How dare you cross the political genius of Obama? Well look, the guy, is, he's, he's not John McCain, of course, as I just told you another story. He, he's, you know, uh, we're not oblivious to the fact that the Democrats and Republicans are not the same. That would be crazy to say that. At the same time, we wish he would do the things he said he was going to do. That's why we elected him. I think that's a fair ask. And if you don't ask him to do that, well, then he's certainly not going to do it. Now, I say that all of, as a, all of that as a prelude to uh, Jane Hampshire likes to bring the two by four. Okay? So Fire Dog Lake has decided, hey, you know what? You thought it was a great idea to do uh, offshore oil drilling. Uh, we told you it was a bad idea. We were right. And uh, you know what? What's important isn't who's right or wrong. It's what you're going to do in the future. And can you please look outside your window, look in the Gulf of Mexico, look in Louisiana, etc., and realize that you shouldn't continue to agree with the Republicans and give more offshore drilling contracts. So they put together an ad, and they're raising money on this on FireDogLake.com, uh, to uh, air this ad more and more. And it's a nice two-by-four, so let's swing it. Today we're announcing the expansion of offshore oil and gas exploration. We'll protect areas that are vital to tourism, the environment, and our national security. It turns out, by the way, that oil rigs today generally don't cause spills. They are technologically very advanced, even during Katrina. Let me be clear. Uh, I continue to believe that domestic oil production is an important part of our overall strategy for energy security. Spill here, spill now .org. All right, look, if you're going to be on the wrong side of an issue, there's got to be a price to pay. And I like that Jane's got the balls to make him pay that price. Okay, raise the money, run the ads against him until he changes his position, because his position was wrong. So, and, and it was proven wrong. Now, right now, the current plan that Obama has is we stop uh, new offshore oil drilling projects for 30 days. Except there are no new offshore oil drilling plans in the next 30 days. So he's trying to trick us, like, oh, oh, I got tough. I stopped things that were not happening. Wow, thank you. No, the question is what you do after those 30 days. So don't let him get away with it. And look, you got to check everybody. And so in this case, Fire Dog Lake checking uh, the president as well they should. Nicely done, Young Turks. <laughs>
that the Department of Justice, which is now running intelligence, has made in both cases, they Mirandized him. They told him, uh, they told both of them, they didn't have to talk and they were, they were entitled to a lawyer. But Eric Holder says, this guy is talking. That they're fortunate. Yeah. Because most, uh, most uh, suspects, when you tell them that, will stop talking. Okay, he's lucky. Well, why won't he share what he's saying with us? That is, I think, anybody in the intelligence community will tell you, when you get a suspect who knows how uh, the terror ring operates, if he's part of a ring, you want to get from him what he knows and not give him the Miranda warning, which is only necessary, even for American citizens, if you want to use their words against him in a trial. And both of these fellows on Christmas Day in New York uh, and Times Square uh, have enough evidence that you could convict them. You don't need to Mirandize them. You don't need to give them that warning and potentially shut them up and certainly give them a lawyer who will tell them to be quiet. Uh, he, experts that say uh, you don't have to give them a Miranda warning. Really? Which experts? I've never heard an expert say that. Never. Uh, if they do, they have no idea what our justice system is about. They, they've never been inside an American court. You're going to tell a suspect, no, 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 don't give him his Miranda warnings. Who says that? And then second of all, he says, oh, no, no, most suspects uh, shut up when they get their Miranda warnings and they don't talk. Unbelievably untrue. Not even close to true. What's shocking, and I'm not a big fan of the Miranda warnings overall, but I'm not a fan of these guys saying, oh, all right, let's selectively uh, do, he doesn't get Miranda warnings, but he does. That terrorist doesn't because he looks uh, brown skin, but that terrorist does because he looks nice and white. Okay, it's, uh, that's dumb. And especially if you have the system without changing it, and you don't give them the Miranda warnings, and then what are you going to do? You're going to blow the case, and you're going to let the guy out. Is that what you want, you idiot? Okay, and so he says, uh, most suspects shut up. And uh, like I said, I'm not a big fan of the Miranda warnings, but they don't shut up. That's what's amazing. No, they continue to tell you exactly what happened in an overwhelming majority of the cases. See, these guys talk without having any facts. What, and, they, and I say it all the time, their great advantage is that their uh, followers don't care about facts. They're not interested in facts, so they can say anything they like. And nobody's going to double check on them. And then uh, finally, the thing that really made me mad about that clip is how many times you say, oh, they got lucky. I got lucky. They, they were fortunate. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I know. Bush was really unlucky every time. He was unlucky with bin Laden. He was unlucky with Zawahiri. He was unlucky with the guys who did the anthrax stuff. He was so unlucky in all these different cases. Oh, he was unlucky when 9-11 happened. He was unlucky when Katrina happened and he didn't respond, etc. Uh, but when Obama catches people, and it's not him, it's everybody put together, FBI, New York police, etc. When he catches them in 48 hours, oh, he got lucky. Oh, he was just fortunate. It's funny how he keeps getting lucky and your doofus kept getting unlucky. Or perhaps as you think, maybe facts matter. Maybe working hard matters. Maybe caring about the job matters. Maybe thinking that the government can work in protecting us, in catching the bad guys, etc. That might matter. Did you think about that, Kit Bond? You, the, a, anybody thinking to put these guys back in charge when they don't even believe in government, they don't believe in doing their job, you're crazy. Kit Bond, if he was president, as an example, he'd be like, ha, let's just sit around, wait to get lucky or unlucky. <laughs> well, what? Oh, no, golly gee, we didn't catch him. Well, we got unlucky. <laughs> oh, we caught him, but we tortured him. <laughs> Did we get any evidence? No. Who cares? We tortured him. Nah, nah, I guess we got unlucky that we didn't get any evidence. Idiots. <sighs> Every day I try not to call them idiots. Every day I fail. Because <laughs> they just keep pushing me, pulling me back in. All right. So, now, uh, the most important story of the day. Uh, yesterday, we were telling you about uh, a vote that was going to happen in the Senate. Um, it had momentum. Uh, the brown uh, Kaufman Amendment uh, to limit the size of the big banks. And I was surprised and excited. And I said, why? Wow, I can't believe it has momentum. Breaking up the big banks, that would be real. That, you know, that's not weak sauce reform that I was worried about. That's you know, getting a real reform. I mean, you're going to take Citibank and break it up. So, and the reason to do that, obviously, is that if they're that large, uh, and they fall, well, they drag everybody down with them, right? It's obvious. It's the most obvious thing in the world. Uh, 13 bankers is all about that. It, three different uh, Fed chiefs uh, in uh, Kansas, Dallas, 
uh, and, uh, and in St. Louis all agree uh, we should split up the big banks. I mean, those are the heads of the local Fed. Can you imagine that? So, and almost all of the major economists are significantly concerned about that. And then we've got senators who are pushing it. You've got conservatives who might join in. Everything's looking great. They had the vote. You ready? 61 to 33. Fail. Not even close. <laughs> Nobody didn't need a filibuster. It could, would have broken a filibuster the opposite way. Not within miles of getting it passed. So all that excitement, that's why I warned you guys, don't get too excited when you hear good news, okay, because they'll find a way to kill it. And this one was easy. They were like, oh, yeah, too big to fail. <laughs> nice try, kids, run along. Now, the funny thing is it was bipartisan in some small way. They actually got three Republicans to sign on, maybe for appearance sake, but I don't care. Votes matter, right? So Richard Shelby uh, from Alabama, Tom Coburn of Oklahoma, and John Ensign of Nevada. Give them credit. They voted the right way. And then you got 27 corporatist uh, Democrats who all voted the wrong way. Um, it's a big list. Uh, I'm going to read it, okay? Uh, Daniel Okaka from Hawaii is a corporatist, uh, protects the banks. So does Max Baucus of Montana, definitely Evan Bayh of Indiana. Uh, Bennett of Colorado is a disappointing vote there. Uh, but apparently he's also a corporatist. Uh, Tom Carper of Delaware is not surprising. Of course, Ken Conrad of North Dakota. Of course, Chris Dodd, who's looking to get a nice big job when he gets out uh, as the head of the banking committee. He's retiring. He'll uh, wind up uh, being a lobbyist probably for the financial industry. He does his job, votes the right way in favor of corporate America. Uh, Diane Feinstein, another huge corporatist from California. Gillibrand, who pretends to be a progressive from time to time in New York. She votes uh, with the banks. Uh, Hagen in North Carolina, she'll pretend it as, oh, I'm from North Carolina, really? In North Carolina, they want to protect huge banks. She'll claim it's because of Bank America, nonsense. In a way, is from Hawaii, longtime corporatist. Tim Johnson, huge protector of the financial industry from South Dakota. These are all Democrats. And now, mind you, every Republican, except the three I mentioned, also voted with these corporatists. Uh, and then John Kerry from Massachusetts, enormously disappointing. As soon as I saw him on the list, I was like, ah, it's a good thing he didn't win. Uh, Klobuchar, you know, you think Obama's giving you small change. Although Obama fought against this, of course. So always in a no-win situation. Um, so Obama would be on this list if he was a senator. Uh, Klobuchar from Minnesota, Cole from Wisconsin, Landrieu, of course, from Louisiana, Lautenberg from New Jersey, McCaskill from Missouri, Menendez from New Jersey, Nelson in Florida, Nelson in Nebraska, Reed from Rhode Island, Schumer from New York, so-called reformer, ha ha ha, so-called progressive. Shaheen from New Hampshire, I don't know why she's on the list, but I guess she's also a corporatist protector of the banks. Uh, John Tester pretending to be a populist in Montana, protecting with the New York banks, nicely done. Mark Udall in Colorado and Mark Warner in Virginia, all corporatists, all protecting Wall Street's ass. Now, a perfect representation of them is Republican Judd Gregg in New Hampshire, who was indignant on the floor of the Senate while debating this, he said, quote, I don't understand this brown Kaufman Amendment. Uh, basically, what it says is if you're successful, you're going to uh, break them up. I mean, where does this stop? Do we take McDonald's on? Did McDonald's crash the world economy? Did McDonald's need trillions of dollars in bailout money? No, the bank said, which part of that was successful, Senator Gregg? The part where they robbed us of taxpayer money? I guess in your book, you got paid, they got paid. I guess it was a success. He's calling the big banks success? And that we're punishing their success by breaking them up? No, the reason we want to break them up is not because we don't like them, you moron. It's because they're endangering the entire economy if they're taking these grotesque risks. They have such a large chunk of our assets that if they go down, we all go down. That's what we're trying to prevent. And if you don't understand that, you're stupid. But the reality is you're not stupid. In, you're much worse. You're a dishonest, easily bought politician who's in the back pockets of these uh, banks, and you go out there and you lie for them. This, that speech was entirely disingenuous. You want to know how big the banks are? Now, you tell me if it makes sense to keep them their size. The four mega banks, the largest ones, hold 7.4 trillion dollars in assets. What do you think happens if they go down? 
they pull everybody down, give, give you a percentage wise. That is equal to 52% of the nation's estimated total output last year. 52%. Now, are they too big? Four banks, more than half of our entire GDP last year. Are they too big? Ah, well, what's next? We're going to go go after McDonald's? <laughs> Did I do a good job? Give me the money. Give me the money. Give me the money. Yeah. No, tax rate. Pay them. Pay them. Look at all their wonderful success. Pay them. As long as you get paid, right, Greg? Man, I'm, I'm so mad at these guys. I'm barely containing much worse things I, I want to say. Top 12 banks in the U.S. control half the country's deposits. Are they too big? Gee, I wonder. Uh, in, do you know that in 1998, which is not that long ago, it was 12 years ago, it needed, you needed 42 banks to, include, to have that same uh, half the country's deposits. Now you just have 12 banks. Are they too big? Gee, I don't know. I wonder. Uh, so, uh, our hope, flush down the toilet, easily. Banks win uh, a crushing victory, no problem, no sweat. Okay, uh, better luck next time, kid. Okay. Now, there are other parts of reform. They're going to vote on them next week. And by the way, why the hell have they not still voted on Sanders' Fed audit, right? I mean, they introduced that on Tuesday. Well, that's because Harry Reid thinks the longer you delay, the worse it's going to, the more likely it is to be de defeated. And it looks like they have a compromise, and we're worried that that compromise guts the whole thing. Lose, 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 fail, fail, fail. Look, w one last thing on this, then we've got to take the break, and I've got to do Newsweek in an immigration story. We might not win in the short term, okay? But rise and rise again, and lambs will turn into lions. Uh, okay, I don't want to make it goofy, okay? And I, it's a quote from Robin Hood. But I'm telling you, we're going to go get these guys, okay? It, it might not be tomorrow, it might not be next week, but we are going to go get these guys, okay? W I, and, I, like, I'll give you one quick example. There's a bunch of things to fight on. The Fed audit is a huge one, but another one, is that $13 billion that Goldman Sachs of tax, took ta of taxpayer money through AIG? I I'm not going to rest until we get that money back. They say they don't need it. Fantastic. Then give it back. G Geithner just gave it to them. Just gave up $13 billion away. You know how many schools and teachers and God knows how many things we do with that $13 billion that went into the back pockets of the guys who run Goldman Sachs? No. It's going to take a while. But I promise you, I'm going to do all we can here to go get those sons of bitches and get our money back. Young Turks. All right, back on the Young Turks. Jing and Anna with you. <laughs> uh, we got a lot of fun stories for you in the next hour as well. We have interviews, plus uh, Rush Limbaugh has attacked me. Um, That's always fun. That is. And I'm not kidding or exaggerating. That's exactly what happened. And mm -hmm. so that'll be interesting. Uh, we're going to save that for the third hour. But we've got a ton of stories in this hour, so let's get to it. Yes. Uh, I want to start with uh, Jonathan Whitworth. He is a Missouri man who had his home raided back in February. Now, there's a YouTube video of the raid that has gone viral, and this story is just blowing up, okay? Uh, we're going to go to the video, and you're going to understand exactly why this is such a big story. Police raided his home uh, expecting to find marijuana. All right, now, they did find a small amount of marijuana, just so you know the background a little bit, and uh, his dog did, in fact, get shot and is dead, and then you'll see the wife and the kids and, and what happened next. So let's watch. We 
one. I need one. I need one. I need one. Try to move. Slow it down. Just a minute. Get past him. Get past him. Move. Move past him. Move past him. Don't move! You understand? Put your hands behind your back! Do it now! Behind your back! I'm with you! Let's go! I got him, I got him. You got him, good. Hold Please on. Don't move! We got another injured one. Move. Coming through. Coming through, coming through, coming through. Injured one what? Do not move! What's Don't injured? Move. What is happening? Don't move. God! What is happening? Search warrant. Narcotic search warrant. Don't move. Search. I don't care. Fuck. Why can't be like this? Fine. Please don't have dogs. Please, they're nice dogs. Come Coming at you. Say so what? Leave the dog alone. We're good. Let's get him secure. Uh, he's in handcuffs. Up to your knees. Stand up. What the fuck is that? Turn around right here. Secondary. What you mean? I want a secondary. John. John what? Let's go. I want a lawyer. Okay. John, what's your name? I'd like a lawyer. And I have the right to know your name. I have the right to an attorney. Okay, okay. you do. What do you want? You ain't the wrong. Okay. I'm going to run you out my house. What the fuck did I do? Let me hit you what What the fuck did I do? Did you just shoot? Did you shoot my dog? You shot my fucking dog! Oh my god! My dog is not nice! What the fuck did you do that for? That was so hard! They put her in the van or something. What the fuck was that for? Continue. Why did you do that? I don't know. Somebody got a card? All right, that is, that's essentially it. Okay. Now, look, for, there's a couple of different angles here. Uh, first off, do they have to come in uh, guns blazing? Uh, I think, do they have to come in in this, you know, you know stormtrooper kind of fashion? Uh, I think the answer to that, it, well, there's two, those are two different questions. Uh, first, do they have to come in uh, with this kind of big force stormtrooper kind of, uh, you know, activity? I think the answer probably is yes, okay? Now, hold on. Hear me out. Hear me out, okay? Uh, the reason for that is they don't know what's in the house, and they suspect that he's dealing drugs, I assume. Uh, they, I, if they did this because the warrant said he might be smoking pot, then forget it. I changed everything, and it's with a million percent the worst thing I've ever seen, right? But if they think he's dealing... They don't know what's in the house. They come in strong. I hear that. You don't want the cops to get hurt, right? Did they have to shoot seven times within the house? No. Okay. That's a totally different situation. Now, the, th the thing is, even there, I'm a little in the middle, right? Now, everybody's going ballistic. They killed the dog, et cetera. They didn't need to kill the dog. But, it, you know, it, uh, sometimes there's vicious dogs that are protecting drugs, so they're taught, hey, you don't mess around. Put them down, Okay. And they don't know that it's just a family with a guy, his wife, and, and a little kid, right? And their family pet, right? So if you say, and, I, and I'm, look, I don't think they should have fired the seven shots. I think that's crazy, okay? But if you say, hey, I can understand, they got to protect themselves, at least you're have, I, I'm having a conversation about that, okay? But the real problem is, look at what we're doing for people who are smoking pot. What, what, what happened? What happened? The, was there a national emergency? Is he a terrorist? Was he going to blow something up? We're set, sending in these enormous teams firing seven shots inside a family's house, and they find a small amount of marijuana. What the hell is this drug war about? Why have we declared war on our own citizens? I mean, you know, sometimes the right wingers like, oh, they're coming for us and they're coming for our guns. No, they're coming for your pot, and they're willing to shoot your dog and come into your house and shoot all around when you got your kids in the house over stupid pot. That's what the real problem is. This war on drugs is mental. We have to stop it all together. So I'm less concerned about the particular actions of those cops in Missouri than I am about the whole problem in the first place, that we've got cops all over the country going into all these homes 
and doing all this stuff over a war we shouldn't be fighting in the first place. To be ve very specific about how often this happens, okay, Reason.com, Radley Balco at Reason.com says that there are more than a hundred of these raids in the United States every single day, okay? And when you talk about uh, the SWAT team coming in strong and whether or not that's okay, I disagree with you so much it's not even funny. Okay, I can understand them if they're knocking on the door, they're not opening the door, the door. I can understand them breaking in, whatever. There's absolutely no excuse for them to shoot at the dogs. Okay, let me say, he, he had two dogs. Okay, one of them was a pit bull, the other one was a corgi. They shot at the corgi. Mm -hmm. Okay, what, like I could understand them getting intimidated and scared by the pit bull. Maybe the pit bull ran up to them and they were afraid they were going to be attacked and they shot near the dog so the dog runs away or something but no they shot several times they shot this pit bull and they shot the corgi the corgi was injured but it survived okay there's no excuse for that there's no excuse he was on the floor hold on he was on the floor he wasn't saying anything he was listening to them he was complying and they were still going crazy they were still yelling at him there was a seven-year-old child there it was all unnecessary after they broke in and they saw what the environment was and what the situation was and as soon as they saw the guy on the floor they didn't need to continue with all that it's a dark house they have no idea how many people are inside of it they're going in thinking uh, that oh, we're busting up some drug dealer okay and got uh, pit bulls and I don't know what else is coming at him right they shouldn't be going in the house in the first place. That's the real problem. Because once you send in somebody to go into a house in a hostile situation, God knows what happens. Uh, all right, but I could be wrong. What, yeah, hey, Seuss, uh, you, you were shaking your head. What, what, what do you think? It, it's, it's, it's really frustrating because, look, at, they're, if they've invested this much time and so much personnel to go to this fucking house, they need to know where they're going. And they didn't know who's in there. They don't just go to random houses. And then they knock twice. Search warrant. Search warrant. The guy probably didn't hear him. Like maybe he was going to answer the door. They assume they break the house, the door down. And they go overly aggressive. The, the shooting of dogs is also ridiculous, man. I can't believe they did that. But, but I think the core is they need to do their... I mean, I'm sure this was an inve investigation they did. They didn't just show up to this house. I'm sure they took their time. They, I mean, yeah, they might have been drugged. Do put more time into it. This is so stupid, man. It's so, so frustrating. So I read up a lot on this because this is something that really angered me, right? And what I found is uh, police thought that he was uh, dealing marijuana because there was a neighbor or something who tipped them off. And one of the issues was that uh, the police enforcement didn't have enough information. They didn't do enough investigation to actually do this raid okay mm -hmm. so that's one of the problems and I 100 percent agree they should have done their investigation this is unacceptable but look you know I don't want people to misinterpret what I'm saying it's not that I see that video and I'm not outraged by it I mean they're just minding their own business there's a family it could happen to you you they can w knock on your door you're like hey what's going on I mean how many houses in the country have somebody who smoked pot in them what, that's good enough excuse to shoot all your dogs and fire inside your house seven times? No, it's crazy. What I'm saying is, if you have a senseless war on drugs, you will make mistakes like this all the time. If you're doing 100 raids throughout the country per day, you think you're not going to make mistakes like this all the time? Most of the time, it's just not on YouTube. You don't hear about it. And most of the time, it doesn't affect powerful people. Do you think they're doing these raids in Beverly Hills? Hell no. And they do it to the poor and the middle class, and so they get away with it, right? Because those people don't have power. The problem is a much larger one. We shouldn't bust into people's house because they're smoking pot. It's like, imagine if alcohol was illegal, because it was at one time. And they break your door down. Oh, my God, he's drinking a beer. Shoot his dogs. And, you know, and if a stray bullet hits your kid, well, you were drinking a Budweiser. It's mental either way. Hey, Seuss. But it, it, they... Look, obviously, I'm just thinking out loud. Right? Why don't they obviously make levels? I mean, they don't have to do the overaggression. The, the, the very. It's like they need to show that they're so, they're the authority. You know, like set up a perimeter. If you're, if you're scared, they're gonna run out through the back door. All right, you guys are smart enough. All right, I know how big this house is. Let me set up people in the back so they can't run out. You know, if you think it's gonna be a small scale, your neighbor tipped you off that your neighbor's smoking weed. All right, if you have to investigate it, you have to do a raid, 
this over aggression doesn't doesn't apply to everybody. You, you see what I'm saying? And you know, Jake made a really good point about how this could happen to anyone. M my neighbor could say, "Hey, I think I think uh, the Casparian household. I think they're drug cartels. I think they're selling drugs." Uh, so what does that mean? Police are going to raid my home in that very fashion? That's unacceptable. It's so stupid. This. Uh, I, I'm going to go back to one thing I said earlier, just real quick. Okay, it's. It, it, people are concerned about all the wrong things. Like I said, the right wingers are like mental about they're going to come get my guns or whatever. Dude, nobody's doing that. There's no plan on that. There's nothing. Okay, but this stuff happens a hundred times a day, and you don't hear a word about it. You know, you don't hear. Oh, they're going to come into my house. They do come into your house for fucking drugs, for stupid pot. They're busting down your door. And meanwhile, Republicans are like, can't say it, war on drugs rocks. It rocks. It's fantastic. You're soft if you're not in favor of it. Don't, don't come into my house. It doesn't make any sense. And that's why I get so frustrated at the teabaggers and everybody else. They're always misdirected in the wrong direction, and it drives me nuts. All right, look, we're going to take a quick break here. Uh, we're going to come right back with more stories.